you, all, you might have already prayed for lunch, but if you don't mind, can I just pray for our time together? Uh, Jesus, we thank you so much uh, for your great love for every single one of us in this room, but also every single one of us that we're about to go interact with in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, and all around Austin. And Lord, as we talk about this very important topic, I know it's near and dear to your heart, so give us eyes and ears to see and hear, and uh, hearts that are soft toward your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> well, uh, Doug and Rosie were uh, living in Arizona, and uh, Doug had started his own business. Uh, they wanted to move from Arizona to Austin, uh, mainly to get away from kind of the drug culture uh, that they had been involved with there. And they moved here to Austin, and Doug's business just started to take off, but their marriage was falling apart. Uh, Doug got to know some guys uh, via work who invited him to play softball with them. And both he and Rosie were feeling very lonely here in Austin. And so he decided to play softball, started playing softball with them, found out that some of them were Christians who went to the same church. Um, Rosie, about the same time, uh, was taking her kids to preschool, and some women invited her into this playgroup for moms with other preschoolers. And she started attending that and felt like she was starting to make some friends, even though she found out some of them were Christians, and, and she was an atheist, a pretty devout atheist. But they didn't seem to judge her uh, for her atheism. Instead, they just welcomed her in. Uh, and she was an atheist because... You know, she'd grown up in a very chaotic background and just couldn't imagine a, a loving God overseeing this universe. And so it had rejected the whole idea, but she liked these people, so she kept going. Well, one night, uh, months later, Doug has a dream that he's invited to church. Now, Doug grew up going to church, but then he got involved uh, in, in drugs in high school. He met Rosie, got her pregnant, they moved in together, and then ended up eventually getting married. And he had left church and God far behind. So he has this dream that he gets invited to church and, and he says yes. And, and they ask him, do you want to just watch or participate? And he says, participate. And he finds himself at the middle of all this stuff and really excited about it and wakes up. Well, that day at softball, some of those guys invite him to come to church that weekend. <laughs> Surprising. And having just had that dream, he said yes. And then he went home prepared for a fight with Rosie because he knew Rosie wanted nothing to do with church, Christians, none of that. But interestingly, that same week, Rosie's friends had invited her to go with them to, to their church, and she really liked them, and not wanting to offend them, she had said yes. So Doug and Rosie ended up fighting about whose church they would go to and which friends were most important. <laughs> And the fight continued all the way till Sunday morning. Uh, Doug's a salesman, so he won. And as they're driving on to the campus, Rosie starts laughing and said, your friends go to Gateway Church? My friends go to Gateway Church. And that true story. And Doug and Rosie started coming to our church. Now, they continued with their friends in this mom's group and the softball group. And, you know, we're, we're just kind of uh, exploring at that point. But Rosie actually said this. She said, at that point, I could care less about going to heaven when I died or some invisible spirit that lives in people. But as Doug and I started to apply what we were learning from our friends and the messages in our marriage, I realized this Jesus guy might be on to something. <laughs> and what ended up happening is another guy who had come to faith three years earlier was starting a small group and invited Doug into it. And Doug rededicated his life to Jesus. Six months later, at a baptism service, Rosie gave her life to Jesus and gets baptized. Three years after that, Doug is discipling three, uh, a, a small group of ten men, and Rosie is working with teen moms and, and discipling them. And, and that really is what Jesus is still about. Life by life by life, he's restoring what's lost and broken in this world. And that's what I want to talk about today, the process by which you can be involved, if you're not already, in, in what this beautiful work that God is doing still through us, if we're willing. And that's a key word, we got to be willing. But I've seen this happen over and over and over again. And as I said, literally, we've seen thousands of people come to faith and go from lost to leading others right here in Austin. 
But the first thing we have to do if we want to be a part of what Jesus is doing is ask ourselves the hard question, are we following Jesus? Are we really following Jesus? Because God is restoring a lost and broken world. And so we've got to ask, is God restoring what's lost and damaged in this world through me? In other words, am I seeing friends and neighbors and co-workers around me over the years go from far from God to not only following God, but actually helping others follow God as well? Because I believe that is still what Jesus is up to. And he will, he will show us how if we're willing to follow him into it. Now, uh, several, uh, well, about a, a decade into our church and seeing this process over and over again, I started to realize that um, sometimes people who <gasps> grow up in church or they've been in Christian community for many times end up getting isolated. And, and they, they get so disconnected from the world around, they don't know how to be like Jesus to the people around them. And so I, I actually wrote the book Unshockable uh, Love uh, out of a three-month study of Jesus' attitudes and actions. So I studied a harmony of the Gospels. We take all the Gospels and put them together in a timeline and study it. And I studied his attitude and actions and what he led his disciples to versus the attitude and actions of the religious of his day, the Pharisees. And what I realized is that all of us tend to be on a continuum somewhere between the two. None of us are fully like Jesus. None of us are fully like the Pharisees. But we end up going back and forth between the two. And I actually took all that data and gave it to Barna. You guys familiar with the Barna group? They do, they're kind of like the Gallup poll of Christian America. And they put together a survey, and they surveyed Christian America asking them, questions to self-identify, and, and here was the results out of this study. Only 14% of Christians said they are more like Jesus than the Pharisees in both their attitude and actions. In other words, when you look at the attitudes and the actions of Jesus, only 14% of Christians self-identify like, yep, that's, that's the way I feel about people far from God, yep, that's what I do. 21% have the heart of Jesus, the attitude, but Pharisaical in action. And sometimes it might be that we, we have the right heart, but we just get busy. It's just not a priority. 14% did the right things. In other words, they had the actions of Jesus, but maybe with wrong motives, maybe more the attitude of the Pharisees, like, you know, check a notch in the belt or whatever, get, get my Christian brownie points. 51% of Christians were more like the Pharisees in both attitude and action. Now, no wonder Homer Simpson... <laughs> the prophet of our day, right, looks over the fence at his born-again Christian neighbor, Maud Flanders, and says, Hey, Maud, I haven't seen you in a while. Where have you been? And Maud said, Oh, we've been away at Bible camp, learning to be more judgmental. <laughs> That's our stereotype. That's what we're, we're facing. In the culture, Christians are thought of as racist, bigoted, intolerant, narrow-minded, homophobic, arrogant, hypocritical, judgmental. It's not a great list, is it? Stop and think. If you would ask people in Jesus' day to assign adjectives to him, you think those would be the ones they would say? No, probably not. So something is wrong, and one of the things we have to realize is that all of us, me included, you know, we, we, we go across the spectrum of more like Jesus, more like the Pharisees in attitude and action. And over time, we can, we can shift. And so we have to keep asking ourselves the questions. Now, what I want to do today is I want to walk us through some of the main attitudes and actions of Jesus and versus those of the Pharisees and just take a little self-assessment as we go along. So the first thing is attitude. You know, do we, do we have the attitude uh, of, of Jesus? Now, I like to think about it like this. Um, you can have the greatest apologetic arguments. You can have the greatest gospel presentation. But if what's in your heart and your mind toward a person uh, is not goodwill toward them, they will read it. And that attitude, more than any of your arguments, will affect whether they are drawn toward Christ and whether they actually start following Christ. And think about it. It's true with us, too, right? You, you, you ever uh, been in an argument with a spouse or a, 
a, a loved one and you're arguing over, you said this. No, I didn't. I didn't say that. I said this. And you're arguing over words, right? But the reality is the words didn't really matter. It was the attitude, wasn't it? Because you can tell whether that person is for you or against you or a boss. You ever had someone who you just knew subtly, like you say the right things, but I can tell you're not for me. How'd you feel about that person? Do you want to listen to them? Do you want to be more like them? No. So our attitude is so, so critical. And, and Jesus had an interesting attitude. I like to think about it like this. Uh, when, when Brad and I uh, were li all living in Russia, we were in St. Petersburg. It's the home of the Hermitage Museum. Uh, it uh, ha houses my favorite painting in the world. It's Rembrandt's famous pro uh, uh, <coughs> painting of the return of the prodigal son. Comes out of Luke 15, you know, where Jesus tells a story of God the Father who goes running to his prodigal son and hugs him. And it's it's a painting of that. And it's hanging in the Hermitage. We used to go see it. It's worth millions of dollars today. Why? Well, because it's an original from the hand of this master. Now imagine if you were, you know, in an alleyway outside the Hermitage Museum, and there in a dumpster you find Rembrandt's masterpiece, but it's it's almost not recognizable. It's covered in mud, it's stained, it's torn, it's damaged. So question, would you treat it like mud? <laughs> would you treat it as worthless, as trash? <laughs> no. Now we're all wise enough to know that underneath the mud, there's still a multi-million dollar masterpiece. It just needs to be carefully taken to a master who can restore it to its original value. Now, if we can all see through the mud on a picture, why is it so hard for us to see through the mud on a human? To see the masterpiece underneath. I'm convinced that's exactly what was in the heart of Jesus when he looked in the eyes of every broken, lost, sinful, hurting person. Jesus saw the masterpiece. The Pharisees could only see the mud. Now think about it. This is uh, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, 8, many of us know. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's a gift. Right? So salvation's a gift. None of us can boast about it. Then it goes on in verse 10 says, For we are God's, anyone know? Masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do the good works he planned for us long ago. So think about that. The reason God gave his son and grace to restore people in the right relationship with himself is because when he created all of us, before we were ever born, he saw the <coughs> masterpiece he was creating. He saw who we were all created to be. And grace was given that he might begin the restoration process for all who come to him. Right? Now, if he saw that in us before he ever saved us, <coughs> doesn't he see it in those he hasn't yet saved? So can we see that too? And can we begin to call that out? That, I'm convinced, is what Jesus was doing. Look at what it says um, in... Uh, in Mark chapter 2, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees saw them eating with sinners and tax collectors and asked his disciples, why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, you may not realize it, but Jesus is using biting sarcasm here. <laughs> because did he think the Pharisees were healthy and righteous? <laughs> no, they were going to crucify him, right? No, they, they, they were hiding behind a religious mask and playing religious games. They weren't healthy or righteous, but, but they were deceived. And they only saw the mud in the people around them. That's what, that's what you see in Luke chapter 7. When this immoral woman breaks into the room, Jesus is having dinner at Simon the Pharisee's house. She breaks in. Why would she come into the home of the people who condemn her? Because Jesus is there. there. And word on the street, on 6th Street in their neighborhood, <laughs> is that Jesus has, offers hope for people like us. See that? So she comes in, stands behind Jesus, and she's known as the immoral woman in town. She had a past, and her past was known. And she breaks into tears. And um, then she drops to the ground, and she starts to kiss his feet and wash his feet with her hair, and then rub oil on his feet. 
Jesus never even looks back at her. He's looking at Simon. And Simon suddenly has a look of contempt in his eyes. And he said to his guests, See, if Jesus were the Messiah or even a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. That's, that's exactly what he said. What kind of woman this is? That's a good question. What kind of woman is she? Well, if you see mud, she's worthless. She's just immoral. She's just equal to her mud. But Jesus told him the story. Simon, two people had debts. One very little, one very much. But in that day, if you couldn't pay your debts, which neither could, prison was the option. Same option. Right? So you can pay. So, so, the, so the debtor forgives both of them. Which will love uh, that person more? And then he says, and Simon, she loves me a lot. She has great love in her. See, he saw the masterpiece under the mud. Simon the Pharisee only saw the mud. So our attitude toward people, what do we see when we look at them? You know, they're, they're living together. They're doing drugs. They're in gay relations. They're gay married. They're, you know, cheating in business. What, whatever. What's our, what do we see? Do we just see the mud? Or can we see past the mud to see a masterpiece God's waiting to restore? That's the first thing of our attitude. The second thing Jesus saw uh, with Jesus' attitude is he brought great news to the world around him. The Pharisees only brought bad news. Um, do you realize that you have great news for all the people that you work around and that you live around? That, that what, what you have in Christ is what they want. But do you think like that? Like, I know they would love this if they really got it. Because I think sometimes as Christians, we kind of think, it's kind of like what we have to offer is, is, is kind of like medicine. You know, like, it's not going to taste good, but you need it. Right? But that's not it at all. Jesus said the free gift that he offers is his Holy Spirit who, as we start to trust, naturally produces love. Who doesn't want more love? Joy. Who doesn't want more happiness in this life? Joy. It's deeper than happiness. Peace. Patience. Goodness, gentleness, self-control. It's what everybody wants. And, and that's the attitude we need to go to people with, is that God is actually for you. He's not against you. And, and he has good news for you, good things he wants to offer. The Pharisees, unfortunately, came with bad news. Bad news first. There's something wrong with you. You're a sinner. You need to repent. <coughs> now, that's true. That's, that is absolutely true. But if you study the Gospels, that's not actually what Jesus led with. It wasn't actually for two and a half years that Jesus began to speak some of those hard words like, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. You know? Uh, because if you had seen the thing, if, if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the things uh, that, that you have seen, they would have repented long ago. But for two and a half years, he brings the good news of the kingdom of God and heals their sick and sets people free, serves them. He brings great news. So, do we start with, God is for you, he's not against you. Do we bring good news first? Is that the attitude as, as we engage with the people that we work with, or the people around us? And then, third attitude of Jesus, Jesus offered relationship that restored value. The Pharisees distanced themselves and, and devalued people. So think about it. The heart of Jesus was that the solution to sin is to move closer to people. Think about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a, a notorious little uh, gangster. You know, he's a business guy who was robbing everybody blind. And everybody, they, they said, you just stay away from him. Jesus walks through the town, sees him, and goes, and, and by the way, it says he was passing through. He wasn't, he wasn't planning on staying. But he sees Zacchaeus, and he says, I'm going to stay at your house tonight. Invited himself over for a sleepover. Kind of weird, right? <laughs> why? Why? And, and the whole town erupts. Like, no, 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 no. No, we, have, we despise him. We, put, we push him away. Jesus said, no. The solution to sin is relationship. I'm moving in. And, and it changed Zacchaeus, didn't it? 
Look at the woman at the well. Divorced five times and was shacked up with a guy. And yet Jesus validates her. Even validates the deeper longing. You know? You, you want, you're thirsty, aren't you? And he didn't mean water. And you know, if you knew who, who this is, I would give you living water that would actually satisfy this thirst for love that you have that can't get mad. And she ends up running to all her friends and says, you got to come meet this guy. And he chooses to stay and hang out with her and her friends for several more days. Relationship. That's Jesus' solution. Do we have that in our hearts as we move toward the people around us that are very muddy? Um, Orhan was uh, a Muslim who came from Turkey. He was a world-class violinist that traveled the world, met a girl, followed her to Austin, moved in with her, and then she broke his heart. So brokenhearted, one night alone, he goes over to Dominica Joe's, and he's sitting in Dominica Joe's, and there were these musicians who were, who were playing music, and afterwards they invited everybody into, into this conversation about famous quotes. And so he, they invited him over, and so he came over, and he starts talking with them about these famous quotes. Now, it just so happened this was a group of people from Gateway who had been trained on the stuff we're talking about today. Uh, just like the softball team, just like the mom's playgroup. Okay? This is strategic. And they would, they would discuss famous quotes, but it would always end in the book of James. <laughs> and, they would, and they would have spiritual conversations. So Orhan has this spiritual conversation, and then they invite him to a party that weekend, and he comes. And so he goes to this party with them. And, and he, then he starts to hang out with them and play music with them. And then uh, they invite him to church. He's like, well, I'm Muslim. And they're like, it's all right. Come on. And he says, okay, I like you guys. And so he starts to come. And he starts to hang out with this group. And over the course of the next six months, out of curiosity, he first reads the Quran, never read the Quran. <laughs> then he reads the Bible, never read the Bible. And 18 months later, uh, as I was talking to Orhan, asking him, I said, you've been exploring for a while now. What do you think? He said, you know, I started to realize him. I read the Quran. I read the Bible. I've been hanging out with you guys. And I've realized the difference. Grace. Jesus offers grace. And I need that. And a month later, he got baptized for faith in Christ. Now, relationship. Uh, help and see the masterpiece under the mud, no matter what is going on. And, and, and then helping people see that God is for you, not against you. That He has good gifts to offer you. And as people start to see this, they begin to move toward Him. And that's the way people change. Here, here's the great news. We don't have to fix or change anybody. Actually, that's not our job. You realize that? 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God caused the growth. So the one who plants and waters are nothing, only God who causes the growth, but we are God's co-workers. So the cool thing is, we get to create the, the right environment, and that's with our attitude first, and then the way we treat and invite people in, and then God, in the right soil, causes the growth. All right, so, so let's ask a, a, a question here. A question from Mr. Norman. In what areas do you have the attitude of Jesus? Where do you struggle with more of the attitude of the Pharisees. And again, we're all in a spectrum and, and it changes. It's not all one or all the other. Some years I'm doing great and some years I'm, 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 I'm falling away. So just think about this and maybe at your tables discuss it for a few minutes. <laughs> All right, so assuming in uh, 20 quick minutes we got our attitude right, right? <laughs> uh, then how do we move on to the actions of Jesus, where we begin to see this really, I mean, when you read the Gospels, what you see is Jesus went through life and just more and more of these people just ended up in his orbit, circling with him, and then before you know it, they are his leaders of his church. It's amazing. And somehow that's how we got here. So how was that? Well, let's look at what Jesus taught people to do. And today, how does someone not only come to Christ, so not just pray a prayer of faith, but how do they become followers of Jesus as a part of his church community or Christian community? Here's what I've seen. 
It takes one Jesus-like person with his attitude who listens and serves and loves and shares our faith. So that's what we've been talking about. And, and we like to talk about it like this. Hang on just a second on that note. Um, we, we, we like to tell people, bless your neighbors and coworkers and the people around you. So just think about the 10 people uh, around you that they already maybe don't know the love and the grace of God. They're not already connected to a Christian community or a church. God's already put you in their life for a purpose, right? And so what if you just bless them? You begin praying for them. You listen to their story. Do you know how many people just want to be heard and, and there's no one listening? Christians have a reputation for talking a lot. We don't <laughs> listen so well. You know Jesus asked many more questions, almost twice as many as he asked. Uh, so then, uh, I mean, as, as he answered, sorry. <laughs> I knew something was wrong. <laughs> uh, so, so bless, begin praying, listen, uh, eat with them, uh, serve them, and share your faith with them. So as you begin to do that, that's a start, but it's not enough. So what I've found is that it also takes introducing someone to a tribe of Christians that they feel like they can belong to. Four or five other Christians that they become friends with. Because today, people are not asking, what is true? And I'm on this lone pursuit of truth. They're, they're, they're looking for a little family. Because the family is no more. Right? And so they're looking for people who will love them. And they find their tribe or the closest they can. And they're not about to leave it until they have another tribe. So they're not going to join the tribe of Christians and, and get cast out here until they have a little tribe that they feel like they could belong to. So we'll talk about that. And then third, come as you are learning space. Oftentimes six to 18 months. People don't know much about Jesus or the Bible at all. They just don't anymore. And so, so how does that happen? So let's talk about this process that I saw studying a harmony of the Gospels. And it's kind of like a, a, a wave. Um, you know, a wave is, is this energy that moves through water, right? But it's interesting the way it moves through water. Uh, the little particles, the little molecules of water actually just move in little circles. And, and as they move in circles bigger and bigger around and around, that's how the wave propagates through the water. And in a similar way, each of us, like those little molecules, as we work together, moving in these circles, like Jesus taught his disciples too, the Holy Spirit moves across the waters of humanity in a, in a movement of impact. So what are those? Let's, let's talk about them. Go on to the next one. The, this is what Jesus was doing with his disciples. First year, he just called them to follow. Hey, come and see. Second year was a call to be equipped. If you will follow me, I'll equip you to be fishers of men. Third year, a call to ministry. He sent them out in the villages ahead of him to do the very thing he was doing. Think about this. They're, they're only two years into this. Th three and a half years later, called to multiply. All right, now, everything you've seen and learned from me, go help people be identified, lead them to faith, and teach them, and, and make followers or disciples of me. So this is the process. Jesus intended every ordinary person to be able to do the same thing. So how do we do that? Well, start with building a commission core. So don't do it alone. You gather with maybe a small group that you're in at your church or your business community or groups right, right here that you can form. Um, I wrote that book for that. Study it together. Study the life of Jesus. And, and I put lots of stories of how he's still doing it today to inspire you. And then start to think, okay, how might we do this together? Do what together? All right? Go on, go on to the next one. First, you start by creating relational momentum with the people around you. You start to build relationships. You start to create community. So think about it. This is what Jesus was modeling for his disciples. Jesus went to dinners. He went to parties. He went to weddings. And he brought his disciples along. He went to where people did life. And he brought life. When they ran out of wine, he makes more wine. Scandalous. <laughs> if you're from a Baptist background. Right? <laughs> um, you know, Jesus, this is what was said about it. Jesus said this, Matthew eleven nineteen. 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say he's a glutton and a drunkard. No, he wasn't. But he went to where the gluttons and drunkards partied. <laughs> right? 
And, and we don't have to be darkness to enter the darkness with light. Right? And that's what he did. They say, I'm a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. What are our deeds? Are our actions that we go and, and we build relationship with people where people live? You know, Steve and, and Joanne were a part of a church that we helped plant in San Antonio. And um, they were going on mission to, to try to see people come to faith and become the church. And so they adopted their block. So the street they moved into, they, they just adopted it and started to try to bless. So they began to pray, you know, for the people on their block. And, and they got to know them, listen, ask questions. You know, you got to be a, like a spiritual detective, asking questions. Find out sp people's spiritual backgrounds because that's where God's at work. And so they started to do this, and then they would eat with them and, and invite them over for barbecues. And then they started getting invited to their parties, which got a little crazy sometimes. But at the parties, they met people. Simon and Terry uh, was a couple that they met at, at one party. Simon and Terry wanted nothing to do with church or Christians or anything like that. But Steve found out that Simon liked to ride mountain bikes, and he did too. And so they started riding mountain bikes together. And so they just became friends. And then they would invite uh, Simon and Terry over and have dinner. And they would invite their small group there as well. And their small group was learning the same process of just relational momentum and, and so they just had fun together. And they continued to ride bikes together. And this continued for several months, and they had conversations, but Simon really didn't want to talk about spiritual things much. About three or four months down the road, the, the, their small group was doing a serving project uh, in, in some of the uh, inner city of uh, San, uh, San Antonio, throwing birthday parties for little kids and stuff, and invited Simon Terry, want to come serve with us? And they said, sure, that sounds good. So they go and they, and they serve. And so they're getting to know the small group. They're serving with the small group. Six months later, um, Steve and Simon are riding bikes. And, and, and Steve says, hey, you know that group that you've been hanging out with and serving with and everything? We, we meet together uh, every couple of weeks and we talk about spiritual things in the Bible and just how it applies to our life to help us become better people. Would you guys want to come? And to his shock, they said yes. And so they come to their small group. And that night, uh, they opened up. So Simon uh, opened up about how a friend became a Christian, became really pushy, just wanted nothing to do with them. And Terry said, I just can't imagine the idea of a loving God and shared how she had been sexually abused growing up. And how could there be a loving God when he allows that? And they didn't quickly try to solve that problem. They didn't quickly try to answer the question and fix her. They actually showed compassion. Like, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Interestingly, Terry later said on the drive home, he, 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 uh, uh, I mean, uh, Simon later said that on the drive home, he said to Terry, wow, they didn't go all Ned Flanders on us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I could, that's, that's that born-again couple in the, in the Simpsons. See, it's really out there. In the <laughs> and, uh, and he said, I think I could do that again. So now they start coming. So they're coming to a small group. They're serving with a church. They're engaged, but they've never been to this church. Then they actually start coming to the church. A year and a half later, Simon and Terry get baptized in their hot tub in their backyard for faith in Jesus. But here's the other thing. Their mother-in-law was coming along with them. Some of their co-workers were coming along with them. It's like the woman at the well. You create the process of building relational momentum. You put these things in place, and you're going to see more and more and more people start to invite their friends to explore faith as well. So you build, so you create relational momentum. The next thing, oh, oh, so here's a question just to, add, to address for a few minutes. How will I or we create relational momentum with those outside the church? So just talk about a few ideas you might have for, for a second. Yeah, I mean, that's the greatest thing you can give anyone. <laughs> With the story of Steve and them, you can serve your neighbors with your neighbors, and, and this as well is a part of the process. So remember, Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. 
even to the point of laying down his life. And this is what he taught his disciples to do. He went into the villages and he met needs. He cared about the people. He showed he cared. And, and you can serve the people around you, your, your coworkers, your neighbors, but sometimes it's just as effective to invite them to serve others. Maybe there are types that, you know, I don't need anything. Great. Get them serving others, just like uh, Simon and Terry did. But sometimes serving them can be a powerful thing. Uh, Karen uh, started going to our church. She grew up in church. She went to a Christian university, uh, came to our, our church when she was working for a young single woman uh, that loved to come in on Monday morning and tell of her all of her wild Sixth Street crawling and uh, sexual escapades and all that. And Karen knew that her job was to make sure that her boss knew she did not approve. <laughs> but we, we got to stand for truth, don't we? Yeah. But how? Okay. So, so she felt like that's my job to make sure she knows I don't approve. And the more she did, the more details her boss would give, <laughs> just to push her buttons. And a wall of hostility grew between them until they hate. She said, "I really struggle with hating her." She heard us teach on this. We did a series on this. And she said, I felt convicted to start praying for my boss. And she started praying for her boss. And somewhere along the way, she said, God said to her, prompted her, don't just pray for her, serve her. Well, the problem is she didn't know her. So first she had to actually get to know her to know how to serve her. So she had to start listening and asking questions. And she found out her boss had cats. When her boss was going on vacation, she offered to help watch her cats. Her boss was kind of shocked. Uh, she found out when her boss's birthday was. She organized a surprise birthday party in the office. Her boss is super shocked. When her boss's car broke down, she offered to give her boss a ride and started giving her a ride. And over the course of that year, she said, I started to see her as a human and actually like things about her. And then, surprisingly, her boss gets laid off. Guess who her boss called? Karen. She called her and just needed to talk. And then she asked her this. She said, Karen, why have you been so nice to me? And Karen said, you know what? I realized I have not been treating you like Jesus would. That he loves you and he sees great things in you and I hadn't been acting that way at all. And it starts this spiritual conversation. And she invites her to church and her boss starts coming. Well, a year and a half later, after I told their story, they come up to me both in tears. Because not only had she come to faith, they were spiritual running partners, accountability partners, growing in faith together and friends. And they said, can you believe what God has done? Wow. But that is what Jesus does, if we're willing. So it starts with the attitude. Then we begin to build relational momentum. We serve our neighbors with our neighbors. And then we've got to create, uh, we'll skip that question for a second. We've got to create come-as-you-are learning space where we can... Lead people to faith, where people can come to faith. Now, we live in an age where it's, honestly, it's right here in Austin, it's more like it was in Russia when Brad and I moved over there with our, with our spouses. Because it had been 70 years of atheistic communism, right? You don't go look for Christians to start a church with after 70 years of atheistic communism. You just start meeting people. And they, and they can't just hear about Jesus and, you know, uh, I mean, we were sharing the four laws. We, we couldn't just share the four laws. It's like, what God? How do you know there's a God? Which God? What's he like? I mean, there's so many questions. They got to learn. Same here. So where do you take people where they can learn? And usually, like I said, six to 18 months now. Now, maybe it's your church. I hope so. Um, you know, where they could feel, feel comfortable learning. Uh, if not, there are other options. Alpha, you know, Alpha is a great environment that you could start, you know, with, with your network of people now and, and, and lead them through that. Or you could just start an investigative, you know, opportunity where it's driven by, by their questions and you've got to leave lots of space for there to be messiness. But that is a part, uh, a part of how, how you can do that. Um, Jesus was doing this, by the way, 
Matthew 5. Now, when, the, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountainside, sat down, and began to teach them. Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners would all gather around to hear Jesus. The Pharisees would mutter, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And he teaches them. See, he knew they weren't going to go to the synagogue. That's where they felt condemned. So he sets up these open-air environments where they can come as you are and learn about this Father who is good. And he'll take them back if they turn back. Right? And welcome them with loving arms. Okay. Um, we're, uh, we're about out of time. But let me go on to uh, what you can do to get going in, in this. And by the way, you know, this is just a beginning, not an end. Um, Brad's going uh, to be doing these kinds of things in the next months to come and really dive deeper into how you do this and talk through God's space. Uh, another book that really wrestles with these kinds of things. But if you, if you want to get started, here's what I encourage you to do. First, just start thinking, who are the 10 people I can bless? And there on your worksheet, we put just 10 blanks. Uh, put, go, go forward to the bless, the bless one. Or go forward, right there. So just begin praying for those 10. Um, I actually wrote down their names. Uh, some of them were in my neighborhood. Uh, some of them, you know, I coached uh, soccer for years. Do you know that in a period of seven years, 24 people in our neighborhood or that I coached in soccer came to faith and got baptized and started following Jesus as a part of our church. You can see the same thing. It's what Jesus is doing. It's not, it's not us. It's not up to us. Don't be afraid. You can't do it anyway. But he can and he will if we're willing. And so just start thinking, who are those 10? And if I can give you a homework assignment, write down those 10. And I'd even write them on a card and put it in your your bathroom mirror, somewhere you go every day, every time you see it, pray for one of them, or the two of them. Begin praying for them, and watch how then he opens opportunities. And then do, do simple things, like walk, don't wave. So our neighbors, in I go, TV, I can't wait, long day at the office, right? No, instead of waving, walk. Walk over, how you been? Listen. Ask questions. Start to get to them. Be a spiritual detective. Find out what is going on in their lives. It'll inform how you pray. It'll inform how you care. And then invite them to come eat. Invite them into your home. That's intimacy. It opens people up. And then serve them. Find ways to serve them or invite them to serve with you. Share your faith with them. And then the second thing is get a group of Christians who want to... Follow Jesus and see him restore what's lost and broken. And, and, you know, start to talk about this stuff together. And then start to create that relational momentum together. And just watch what Jesus does. All right, any questions before we, before we wrap up? Hey. Yes. Oh, awesome. And I've three people, strangers, that have responded, what is it? I've never been to one, but I've always heard about all the So being from different denominational backgrounds, where do I start with just complete strength? Well, I think that's awesome, first of all. <laughs> I mean, I was shocked at that. Three people right off the bat. Like, did, I mean, did they make somebody with next door? Yeah. 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 Okay, so I, yeah. um, I'm a... If, if gathering leader and Jamie yeah. and I both, yeah. and um, that's just part of our thing. This just is so in the line of the Holy Spirit where we are yeah. in our movement. Yeah. So um, just shocked that three people right in the vicinity of maybe I don't know ten miles. Yeah. All, like, so, but see, this I'm is this is the thing we don't. This is this is uncomfortable. Yeah. 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 We're strangers, y'all. Yeah. 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 And so. Get ready for the mess and be okay with it. Yeah. Because you know what? This is what helped me. God already knows. And he's okay with it. He's, I don't want to lead, lead them wrong. Right? No, no, no. I don't, don't, want, I don't want to go like, yeah. deep into some sort of you know, theology or apology. Yeah, don't start there. <laughs> well, really. No, no, it's, a, it's a great thing. So, um, you know, Brad can probably, Brad can probably help you with some icebreakers, like just some simple questions. And what we do 
in our groups, because we have non-Christians come to them, is we start with telling your story. You want to start with things that everybody, it's, there's no wrong answer. Everybody can get it right. You lay down some rules of the group, which is really important. Um, and, uh, and, and we can we can send you some stuff like that. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and these guys can help with it. I mean, because they've led investigative studies like that. And, uh, you know, what, what, what I think you can do is ask a lot of the questions that they have and say, you know, we can base some of it around your questions and then we're just going to read about Jesus. You know, you, you might realize that Jesus is, you know, one of the, one of the best known historical figures ever, but most people don't know even what he said. So we'll just read what he said and talk about it. Okay. That's, and say, you know, and hopefully it'll help us all be better people. Guess what? Everyone <coughs> wants to be a better person. Be more loving. You know, so you just use language like that. That's and, awesome. And we, we do this within our movement, but to branch out where they know nothing about it. Yeah. So like when we do it in with our, our comfort zone, it's 10 people, and we kind of own the group together. And right. so we put up topics and we all choose them. But is that maybe not the right direction? Should I be more yeah, the I would. Yeah. Source? Should I be more the guiding yeah. source? Yes. Yeah. But don't be but don't be afraid to ask questions and let them talk because that's adult learning, and it will get messy. And they'll say things that are so out there and off and theologically wrong, and just say, "Lord, is now the time to deal with this, or should I wait?" And many times it's 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 way because and that's why if you bring like I did this with a, a group um, when we were starting the church because we started the church here I didn't know anybody in Austin so it was just people from Austin. So they come in, and we start going through the book of John. And we would, we would read, and I would ask questions, and they would say the craziest, wildest things. You know? And then I would just kind of say what I thought at the end to bring it back and wrap, wrap it up and then ask another question. And then along the way, you know, week two, they were like, hey, wait a second, can I take a smoking break? Like, I can't concentrate if I don't get a smoke. I'm like, okay, that's messy. Well, I'm like, okay, go ahead. And they did. And then it comes out that another, I mean, it's, it was wild. And all of them came to faith that year. Wow. It took a year. A year. A year. So you've got to be patient. So it's it's not in our time, it's the Holy Spirit's time. So, John, approximately how frequently did you guys meet? I say. What was that, in the group, in the small in group? Particular, yes. We met weekly. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Time, but a lot of our groups meet every other week. It okay. just depends. I was just trying to put the year, year and a half into perspective as, you know, how often are, are they meeting weekly? Yeah. Any other questions before we wrap up? All right. Well, thank you so much. And by the way, you know, they're going to keep going, so be sure to keep going. Coming. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, with the staff, stand up, staff with crew, stand up, all the attorneys to pay,